Over the last 30 years, remarkably little has been done to document the history of financial, therapeutic, and operational policy with respect to addiction and behavioral treatment. As part of our mission, C4 has developed a series of films capturing this important oral history. David R. Gasfriend is a psychiatrist and internationally recognized addiction treatment researcher. He's the former chief executive officer of the Treatment Research Institute, TRI, and the current chief medical officer of Dynamic Care Health. In April 2017, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute awarded a five-year grant to TRI to study addiction treatment under the direction of Dr. Gasfriend. This is the first large-scale trial to integrate evidence-based practices of the personalized addiction treatment to health model known as PATH, peer support, cognitive behavioral relapse prevention, contingency management, and FDA-approved medications, and compare them with standard care practices typically offered to patients with OUD, opioid use disorders. With 800 OUD patients, it's one of the largest ever randomized controlled clinical trials of addiction treatment. So my uh, connection to this field came in medical school. I was uh, active in the American Medical Student Association, AMSA, which was 20,000 medical student activists across the country. Um, and the uh, leadership was very committed. This was uh, at the end of the 60s, the early 70s. And um, we wanted to improve medical education. There was a staffer at AMSA um, by the name of Lori Gorman. And uh, we became boyfriend and girlfriend. And I learned through the relationship that she was in recovery for five years from alcohol dependence and um, physician-induced benzodiazepine valium dependence. And she almost died because the physician saw this sweet young thing that was nervous and didn't have a clue that it was alcohol and um, put her on valium. And uh, that worked really well. And uh, so Lori um, went through um, Valium withdrawal, um, quite severe. Um, fortunately, she survived, and she went on to a wonderful career, um, and at that time was writing grants, getting federal funding to foster medical education. When I learned about this, I felt betrayed by my medical school. I had learned about the liver, and uh, liver disease, and um, you know, I said to her, oh, I've learned all about alcoholism, and I told her what I've learned, and she basically said, so the truth is you don't know shit about alcoholism, right? And so I started going to AA meetings to learn about it because my professors couldn't teach me a thing. And uh, I wrote my first grant as a medical student to um, provide extramural education for medical students by taking them to rehabs and having them learn from the staff at the rehabs, most of whom weren't physicians, of course, right? Um, I got introduced through her connections to people at the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. At the time, NIAAA was funding a marvelous national program called the Career Teacher Training Program at Addictions. And the Career Teacher Training Program provided funding for 70 uh, junior faculty members to work under senior mentors who did research in addiction and to become the next generation. And that introduced me to people like Dr. Uh, David Lewis and Dr. Ed Gottheil um, at Jefferson and all of these fascinating people they invited me to come to their annual meeting and talk about what learning about addiction was like from the student perspective in medical school. And I got to talk to the 70 career teachers and the faculty for them, so 150 people, about how little we were learning and how, if we knew, how we were being left bereft of knowledge and skills 
we would be upset about it and we would want to fix that. So they welcomed me into the field and when I graduated I trained in psychiatry and I went into um, the alcohol clinic uh, where my residency was at Massachusetts General Hospital. I went on to the faculty at Harvard Medical School and I devoted my career to treatment of alcoholism and we decided the clinic had to expand to drug addiction. Remember, in the early 70s, it was still illegal to treat a person in Massachusetts for alcohol or drug addiction. They were treated, if you can call it that, in jail. So the jails dried people out, and then they were sent out again to become sick all over. So this was by the end of the 70s, and I finished my residency in 1984 and came on the faculty at Harvard and spent 25 years there and developed the addiction research program at Massachusetts General Hospital. And I became frustrated at the, the inertia in the field and uh, the lack of adoption of science, which was progressing. And I ended up devoting my time increasingly to developing new technologies to leapfrog the obstacles in our field. Uh, the first technology I decided to work on was the ASAM criteria. So I became very active in the American Society of Addiction Medicine at the invitation of Jim Callahan, the executive director. Uh, this was a society founded by Dr. Ruth Fox um, back in the 1950s and 60s, and it became a national force for upgrading the quality of care and awareness and lobbying uh, at the federal level. And so leadership um, like uh, LeClaire Bissell, uh, Max Schneider, people who are gone now but who really fostered that whole first generation of um, the faculty, the people who started the fellowships in addiction psychiatry and addiction medicine. And um, this society through work by Dr. David Mealy uh, who became a dear friend of mine, um, wrote the or consolidated the first rules for who should go to which level of care, hospital, residential, partial, outpatient. And they published this as the ASAM criteria in 1991. I read the book at the time and thought, this is brilliant. This is full of pearls of clinical wisdom. And I went to David Mealy and said, hey, has anybody done research to test the validity of this? Because I think that could easily be done. And he said, no, nobody's done that, but why don't you do it? And if you know David, he's a master of motivational interviewing. <laughs> and the next thing I knew, my whole career was devoted to this thing. So um, my team at Mass General Hospital, which was by this point growing to about a dozen people, um, proposed the first project to computerize all the decision rules in that book. And by 1994, we were funded by the NIAAA. We programmed the whole book of decision rules into software. This became a structured interview that guides the counselor to ask all the questions you need for a biopsychosocial interview, all six dimensions of ASAM's measurement. And then the decision algorithm spits out the exact level of care that the patient needs to do ideally um, best in their outcomes. And then we did a whole series of research studies to see does it actually work. And we started seeing in every study a signal that it worked, that matching does better than mismatching to a lower level of care. We also found that mismatching to a higher level of care is not just more expensive than it needs to be but in some cases can have worse outcomes. So insurance companies and states decided to pay attention to this. And by the year 2000, about 35 states in America were endorsing the ASAM criteria for patient placement. Um, at that point, SAMHSA, CSAT, and uh, people who became officials in the White House Drug Czar's office pulled ASAM into a meeting and said, ASAM, you've got to release this to the field. You have states all over the country that are bastardizing these criteria. 
and putting out one-page checklist sheets that say that they are the ACM criteria, and it's not working, and you got to fix this. So I was on the board of directors of ASAM at this time, and the board said to me, um, will you give us the software? And I couldn't do that because we couldn't manage the customer service, the support. Um, you know, this was federal grant money. So I proposed to help ASAM as essentially its agent and put out an RFP and get an outside technology company to take this on as a partner to ASAM. And we got a lot of help in this. Eventually, we got Harvard Business School to do a year-long case study of the field of addiction and the ASAM criteria and the research software. And they laid out a 30-something page report on how to do this properly. I took that to SAMHSA, and Dr. Wesley Clark pioneered the funding for this. And they picked the vendor to do this, which is FEI Systems. And today, in 2019, we have six out of the 50 states where this is being used in the public treatment system. There are many thousands of counselors who are using this every day for assessment. They're doing it in a standardized, reliable, valid way. The decision engine is producing the level of care recommendations. And it's being used for managed Medicaid for utilization review. So this has really taken off. We have approaching 100,000 assessment records in the database, and that's now being used to empirically analyze how to improve these decision rules, and that's changing the book and changing the software. So now the field is actually one of the tops in technology in the whole field of modern medicine, and addiction is actually leading the way for routine data gathering on the ground right from the patient. And putting a, a feedback loop into analysis software and empirical research that goes right back out to the cloud, to the counselor, and to the decision making again. So that was my first effort in technology. I, I started doing pharmacologic research at Mass General Hospital, and I was approached by pharmaceutical companies which I wasn't really interested in and didn't particularly appreciate. Um, we didn't allow the marketing in our clinic or in our research center. But they started coming up with an idea that the NIH really wanted them to do. And that is to take the molecule of naltrexone, which blocks the opioid receptor in the brain, and create a long-acting version of that. This was important because patients with addiction couldn't stick with taking daily medication to block their high. And so we needed something that would be long lasting. So I worked with two different companies. One failed and went out of business, and the other succeeded. But it was an incredible slog. Uh, this was Alkermes. And I did two independent research studies with Alkermes. And they had an injectable medication with naltrexone that lasted in the body for a month and released the naltrexone into the bloodstream, into the brain, where it blocked the brain's opioid receptors. And after two studies and seeing how effective it was, I felt I could be publishing my research papers till the cows come home, and it's not going to change a thing. And this medication could really revolutionize care. So they asked me, after a year of consulting, to join them, and I did. And I spent 10 years working on this. And we got it through the FDA. Turns out it's not just a treatment for opioid dependence, it's also for alcoholism. It decreases the craving and the euphoria from alcohol use. And it was a very difficult project. Um, the science was terrific, but the adoption, um, selling an expensive technology with this uh, formulation um, at a fairly um, a high price, uh, getting it through insurance companies, and then getting patients to say, yeah, I'll sign up for a month of being blocked out from being able to escape. That was a challenge. It took education. It took programs where the patient really had to want to stay clean. And we developed something that was controversial. It was approaching the criminal justice system. 
um, they had a strong set of reasons for wanting people to succeed. One was public health. Okay, great. But they had to worry about public safety. And so if they could get someone leaving prison who had an opioid or alcohol offense, who was at risk of dying from relapse the day they left jail or prison, and their risks are 100 times greater than the death rate of the general population because their, their reward center is propelling them, compelling them to relapse the day they get out. So we went to sheriffs and judges and parole boards and said, look, you don't allow medication. Maybe you don't allow it because you don't like agonist therapies for opioids, methadone and buprenorphine. We don't actually think that's smart. It's counterproductive for you and for society. But now there's an alternative that is not an opioid. And it will block someone from getting high for a full month. Would you at least try that? And so my concept was, let's use this formulation to pry open the door of criminal justice. And maybe if we're successful with them, they'll realize maybe we should just let these doctors do what doctors do. And then we can open the door wider for buprenorphine and methadone. And indeed, that's what's happening. And it took a long time. Um, Vivitrol, which was the naltrexone month-long preparation, took seven years to start breaking even just on the costs of sales and marketing. But it's now selling at over $300 million a year. And this is not to be a commercial, but to say that you need a, a corporate entity, a pharmaceutical entity, whose board will commit to that time frame which almost no pharmaceutical company will do. But this one chose to do that. I retired from Alkermes in uh, 2014. And at that point, I was consulting. I was working with Treatment Research Institute in Philadelphia, um, led by and founded by Dr. Tom McClellan, who became our nation's deputy drug czar under Obama. and. Um, I had a conversation one day with my oldest son, and this led to the third technology that I've worked on. Um, my son, who's a tech entrepreneur, <laughs> said to me one day, Dad, we have this opioid epidemic. We have cousins, we have family, who almost died from this disease, and your treatments aren't all that good, as only a son would say to a father. <laughs> and I chuckled and I said, well, Eric, we have one methodology that would be the envy of any in modern medicine, except nobody will use it. And he was shocked and he's, you know, he said, like, why the hell not? And I said, well, it's called contingency management. It actually doesn't talk to the patient like counseling and it's not a medication. It addresses the brain's reward center deep within the brain, below the thinking cortex, outer gray matter region. And it's like a reflex. It stimulates the reward center, which is kind of burnt out with chronic addiction. And it provides money as a reward rapidly for healthy behaviors. And you increase the money, you start small, and you increase gradually to develop a streak of effective behaviors for recovery, attending visits, going to AA meetings, taking drug tests, and being abstinent. And this works better than pretty much any other behavioral treatment we have, it works like a medication. It doubles to triples the success of abstinence and retention and treatment. There are 100 random control trials of this, but nobody will use it because it's so difficult to manage. So he wanted to know the obstacles, and I reviewed those, and he said, well, Dad, don't your people realize that with technology, you can overcome every single one of those obstacles? And it was an aha moment for me, and I said, what the hell are you talking about? And he went through all these technologies, like video selfie monitoring of drug testing remotely with pocket-sized drug tests or breathalyzers, um, remotely reminding patients of their AA meeting times, showing them the Google map directions <laughs> to get to the meeting, and then using the phone's GPS to track that the patient showed up on time and stayed for the whole duration of the meeting and then paying the patient rewards, not with a research assistant counting out the dollars and filling out the accounting in the spreadsheet, which no treatment program can afford to do, but instead having a smart debit card 
and there's several sources of these, which not only distributes the money instantly, non-stigmatizing, but you can block the card's use at bars, liquor stores, escort services, casinos. Uh, you can't use it after retail store hours. You can't use it for more than a certain set amount per day. And these are all available with current technology, and they're cheap. You can deliver recovery coaching through the app with video and with text and monitor is the patient actu actively using this. So we started putting all these things together. We raised $4 million from investors, and these include investors like former Congressman Patrick Kennedy and his wife, um, who became advocates for this, and then said to us, why are you just working with treatment programs? Why can't you offer this to the families themselves? They're giving money to their loved ones, and they're either policing them or enabling them, and either one is bad for recovery. So just this spring, we launched directly to families. And for the first time, we got US insurance companies willing to fund not just the app and the drug testing, recovery coaching, but even incentive monies. So whereas they'll fund your health club membership um, with a substantial amount, could be $150 a year, but they wouldn't do a thing for addiction treatment. But now we have major U.S. insurance companies that are funding incentives to help people's reward systems heal and focus on recovery. So these three technologies, um, the ASAM criteria software, Continuum, um, Vivitrol, this medication that's long-acting, and now we have a long-acting buprenorphine preparation as well, Sublocate, and the integrated care model using technology as a safety net in the week between the visit this week and the visit next week so that the patient all week long can be working. These are three areas that I've focused on to try and enhance what we do everywhere else with counseling, with meetings, um, with the fellowship of recovery, um, and all the other models. And, um, you know, uh, it's taken many, many decades to get the, to the point where we can even use these things. And now the challenge is, can we adopt them? The adoption of these kinds of technologies is progressing. It's going slowly, but it's definitely happening. Um, the fact that we have tens and tens of thousands of patients across the country getting systematic, uh, quantitative biopsychosocial assessments and decision making for their placements, that is standardizing how um, insurance companies will cover treatment in the era of parity. Um, so that's great progress. Uh, the fact that a drug like Vivitrol, um, which is very hard for patients to choose to get onto, uh, and you have to be detoxed from opioids to be able to start it. Um, the fact that that's profitable and the first pharma has proven that a medication like this can be um, viable in this market. That's driving others to seek to develop new molecules and NIDA and NIAAA are working hard to reinforce that development. And uh, criminal justice is using medication now all over the country and it's working. Um, the latest technology I mentioned, this uh, um, Dynamic Care Health app, um, we have systems across the United States in um, Pregnant smoking cessation, University of Vermont is using this. And they tripled the rate of women quitting smoking by their delivery. So they took us to Vermont Medicaid. And Vermont Medicaid is now um, going after funding to study this in their entire system. Um, we have four major US insurance companies doing this uh, with us and funding even the incentives. Um, so it's a model that has an effective return on investment um, that is leading to adoption. Uh, treatment programs, we're here on Cape Cod, where Gosnold on Cape Cod is the largest treatment provider. They've been using this for a year. Um, criminal justice is using it. The New Jersey Reentry Corporation, um, led by a former governor of the state, is using this. Um, Gavin Foundation, where the mayor of Boston is a graduate and a proud board member, uh, they have been using this for over a year. Um, the largest treatment provider in Ohio, Brightview, is using it. Um, we won Harvard Business School's Global Grand Prize 
competing with investment apps and technologies uh, and manufacturing technologies. And we won their $75,000 global grand prize this year um, for an addiction treatment app. Um, the governor of Ohio, John Kasich, who was a former presidential candidate, um, his opioid competition awarded us their million dollar grand prize. So this kind of, of advance is getting attention, it's getting financial support. NIDA and NIAAA have both funded this and many other technologies to enhance addiction treatment outcomes. So the FDA has approved its first um, addiction technology app, uh, Paratherapeutics Reset. Uh, so we're in a new era and the hope is that the providers will do what they know how to do. Um, the recovery fellowship uh, fellowships will do what it knows how to do. But that's a, a model that's been around for 80 years now, since uh, um, you know, Dr. Bob and Bill Wilson sat down and talked to one another. We've been doing it the same way um, since 1935. Um, it's time for a whole bunch of changes. We have a lot of challenges ahead. In the opioid, opioid epidemic, we're advancing buprenorphine adoption, but we're not integrating it well with treatment. So what's happening to people who want to get off buprenorphine? And we know that the average duration on buprenorphine from giant in, uh, insurance company studies where it's covered, the average duration is only about four months. Well, that's not how it should be used. It should be long term and then it should be discontinued when the time is right. We don't even have criteria for that. So ASAM is going to have to work on that and how to integrate that with longer term care and learning the coping mechanisms and the recovery lifestyle. That's not well worked out yet for buprenorphine as good as it is and as life-saving as it is. Uh, these apps are developed independently of treatment programs. How are we going to integrate that care? How do we make sure that the counselors get the data that their, their patient who think is, they think is going great, they're going to seven AA meetings a week, they're getting their signature card initialed by the meeting secretary, they're coming back and showing the counselor, counselor complacent, I'm doing a great job, I'm a great counselor. They get the app and we find the patients leaving within five minutes of every single meeting. So how do we make sure the counselor is looking at the dashboard and seeing that, oh, my patient's in trouble. I can intervene before the relapse happens because they're budding, they're building up to drinking and drugging, but that hasn't happened yet. So we still have to work all of this out. And that means we've got to collaborate. It's time to collaborate with the payers, the insurance companies. They're willing to start sharing the risk with us and bonusing us as providers for doing a better job. That means we've got to do a better job. So I think we've got a bright future here. It's tragic that it's an epidemic of dying white young people to finally convince society that everybody should be paying attention to this and paying for it. But the field can't just say, great, now at least they treat us better. We've got to treat our patients better. If it works, it's going to feel very gratifying. Um, right now it feels very sad that it's taken us so long and that it's still so difficult. Um, it is exciting to see investor money pouring into this field. It's frightening that so much of it is for real estate and not for the quality of care. Addiction is a disease that is eminently exploitable. People are victimized by the illness, then they're victimized by stigma, then they're victimized by exploitation. Our laws, our regulations don't catch up nearly fast enough. If you think about the speed with which Chinese laboratories, 10,000 of them, it's estimated, have marketed fentanyl and related products to kill our young people, this is an absolutely horrifying situation. So as optimistic as I am that there's opportunity to fix the situation. I'm also scared to death about the rate of people dying. Why is China able to do it so fast and we're like uh, in the dark ages? Because we rely on federal regulation to address these kind of problems, uh, uh, customs, inspections, DEA, and we're always behind with the innovations of the dealers. 
whether it was cocaine to crack in the 1980s um, or, or um, heroin to fentanyl in the 2000s. Um, and our government is highly vulnerable to corrupt lobbying. The whole opioid epidemic is caused by pharmaceutical companies, Purdue Pharma. Um, it didn't just corrupt our government, but it, it, it has happened. The DEA backed off of prosecutions that it knew were right to do. Um, it corrupted our physicians. It corrupted our medical societies. Um, Purdue was able to convince medical societies to promote um, the uh, pain as the fifth vital sign model, where physicians were actually um, bonused or punished by their medical centers to ask every patient, what's your pain today on a zero to 10 rating scale? Mm -hmm. What did that do? That gave the implication that it should always be zero. And if you're not producing a zero from the patient's subjective rating of pain, that means you're not a good enough doctor. So prescribe a pain then. Well, that's not appropriate. It's not even medically sound. Pain is the body's way of telling the brain, you gotta take care of me and let me heal. We need pain in order to become healthy. You eliminate pain, you're not doing the body any favors. So we are vulnerable to corruption and um, we're always in the society seeking um, comfort, fast, fast, fast relief. That was the Excedrin commercial. Um, we are always vulnerable to seeking uh, new excitement, uh, new phases of lifestyle, mind expansion, a new high. And the freedom in our society puts us at the greatest risk in the world of any society for drug problems. So we need a lot more sophistication. We need the use of science in government, which tragically we're losing that uh, currently. And um, it takes a lot of collaboration and coordination to pull off a healthier society. I would like to be remembered as having gotten my son interested in this field so that he can bring the talents of his team, Harvard Business School people, um, investors, not just interested in putting money into the care of our patients, but money that isn't driven immediately for profit, but is driven for social impact. Um, I love the fact that we have major investors, one of the biggest hedge fund, hedge fund investors in the world, um, investing for the long term, who realize that aligning with public health long-term objectives is a very good way to align for profit and shareholder value. And when you think of things that way, then we can all work together. And I have tried to stress that, that when you start a business, if it's real estate purchasing of uh, treatment facilities or converting hotels into sober living properties, if you're thinking about the quick sale in a year or two years and pocketing a big uh, surplus, that's too bad for us. Because if you think about a 10-year plan where you're really impacting with comprehensive longitudinal integrated care, I want my legacy to be that we think of addiction outcomes in terms of five-year success rates. We do that for physician recovery and we get 80 to 90 percent successful in five years. Oncology does this, cardiology does this. I want addiction to do this as well. And then we will be a normal, regular, non-stigmatized part of American healthcare. <laughs>